When you have business cards, you're treating your staff as professionals. You're saying to them, go and be an ambassador in the community. And you want your staff to be ambassadors in the community. They're cheap. You can get them at Staples. You can get them at Walmart. Um, you don't have to pay a graphic designer to do them anymore. You can literally go online, pick a template, and order 250 to 500. So if you don't have business cards, put that on your list of things to do before you go. One of the things I've seen yeah, when I work with clients now to help them market and promote their programs better is um, an aversion to photos in, in marketing materials. Um, I'm a big fan of using a combination of in-house photos of real people. If they sign waivers, in Canada you always want to get people to sign waivers. You want adults to sign their own waivers and adults to sign waivers for children. So you may use their photos. But also a big fan of using stock photos. My favorite companies are iStock and Fotolia. That's Fotolia with an F. And Juniper. Juniper, like a juniper bush. You can buy really high quality images for not very much money. I tend to get medium or large size and then you can use them in both print and on your website. Uh, and I use them, I, I, buy, I buy, you know, things that I think represent for me language learning, learning and education. And I use them over and over and over again. Once you buy them, you can use them as many times as you want, providing you don't slap them on a, a, a coffee mug and sell the coffee mug. There are, there are certain um, restrictions. You can't resell the photos. Um, especially in the line of work where words may hinder, the printed word may hinder your message, having photos is an important part of, of our marketing and, and promotion. Okay. Um, we know from fundraising and from marketing that including stories is an important part of the public relations work that we do. Um, there are now tools out there, Photo Story 3 is one of them. If you like technology, Photo Story 3 will help you do digital st storytelling for your learners. So I include that kind of kind of stuff in marketing. It's really important. Have a look at your brochures. If you're if you if you are still producing brochures, and I believe that in certain uh, community organizations that they're still very important. Paper brochures can be very important depending on your organization. Um, have a look at them. If there's no photo on there, put one. This is the 21st century. Every piece of marketing that you do should have some kind of photo. Um, and as well, use, use photos from your own, own organization, okay? a, digital, a digital camera. Okay? That doesn't have to cost you very much money, right? So if somebody has a camera, they can bring it in and take some pictures. Um, the cost is your time, zero dollars, well, except your time. Um, photo eye stock, I think this year I've spent less than $100 and I now have a bank of photos. The other thing with a lot of the uh, stock photo companies is they'll give you a photo a week for free. And early in September they had a fantastic photo of two, uh, two girls, one standing behind the other and one was reading with a book open. And I thought, yes please, I'll have that free photo. That image will represent the work that I do. So check back uh, on a weekly basis and you can get their free photos. These are either professional or aspiring photographers and they want their work out there. Who has a YouTube video for their organization? Really? One or two people? Okay. YouTube is a free online tool that you should be using in the 21st century. I, I don't use the word should very often, but I feel very strongly about this. Um, again, when the printed word may be a hindrance in the marketing work, pictures tell a story. You can take a PowerPoint presentation. I could take my presentation today, um, if I wanted to, and turn it into um, a video and put it on, on YouTube. YouTube accounts for, are free. My suggestion to you would be that your organization have its own YouTube account. Now on YouTube that's called a channel. So you suddenly have a channel for your organization. What do you put on your channel? Well, um, for YouTube videos, a couple of hints. Videos, um, most watch videos are two minutes or shorter. So it's better to have a number of short videos than one long video. 
You may or may not want to include um, a voiceover or a narration. You can ha just have music in the background. You can buy free stock music the same way you can buy free photos. iStock sells some. Um, anybody with a, a Mac computer, you have stock music on your Mac computer. Um, and you can sort of lay uh, music over photos or photos of your learners, anything that you would put up on a photo board, uh, you can do in a YouTube video. Um, your executive director can give a comment about the organization, your board can talk, your learners can talk, anybody with a digital camera can capture a little bit of footage. It doesn't have to be a lot. We're talking seconds here, 30 seconds of video. You make it sharp and powerful and it's great. You don't need to hire a production team. Of course, if you hire professional videographers, you're going to get much better quality. However, YouTube actually has a program for nonprofits where um, they have, I believe it's tutorials, that you can go through to learn more about how to do YouTube in, in the nonprofit world. So check it out, YouTube and then Google nonprofit. Having a video presence online will boost your uh, search engine rankings uh, and it helps you reach out to the community. And you can take a YouTube video and you can embed it on your website so that you have um, streaming, well, yeah, you have video on your website and it's a great way for people to learn about you and again, have that visual image there for them. Social media, there's been lots of talk about social media at this conference, right? Who has a Twitter account? Who is going to have a Twitter account after this conference? <laughs> Super. Uh, who has a Facebook page for their program? Who's going to have a Facebook page? Super. Okay. This social media, um, there's another book I'd like to tell you about. Has anybody ever heard the term guerrilla marketing? Yes. Okay. Uh, there's a new book out, came out in July of this year. I reviewed it for the authors. Uh, it's guerrilla marketing for nonprofits. Guerrilla marketing for nonprofits. Uh, it's by, by, there are three authors. One is the grandfather, if you will, of guerrilla marketing. His name is Jay Conrad Levinson. He worked together with his son-in-law, who's Frank Adkins. And another nonprofit marketer by the name of Chris Forbes, F-O-R-B-E-S, Forbes, E-S at the end. So that was Jay Conrad Levinson, Frank Adkins, and Forbes, Chris Forbes, thank you. Yeah, I, I interviewed him on, online a few months ago. Um, it's a fantastic book about marketing for nonprofits, guerrilla marketing, grassroots marketing, uh, in house marketing, the same kind of stuff that I talk about, but they do it for nonprofits in general. One of the things that they say in there that I just love is that social media is not a social disease. <laughs> That's brilliant. Uh, because it, for people who aren't really techies, they're like, ah, that's social media stuff, who needs that? It's not going away. It's time to get on the bandwagon. This is the 21st century. You want a YouTube account, you want a Facebook account, you want a Twitter account, and you want to get connected um, because it, it, it makes your marketing more powerful. I'm going to tell you a story uh, about something that happened to me in the summer. I went to the post office. And I was standing behind uh, a young gentleman in line, and he was wearing uh, some very expensive, very trendy clothes. And he had a very fancy gadget in his hand. I don't know if it was an iPhone 4 or quite what it was, but it was really shiny. And he, and he was texting in line, and he was doing his thing, and he looked kind of a little gangsta. He had his, his bling on. Um, this was a young man. He was about, I would have guessed, 19 or 20. And he got up to the counter with what looked like some kind of government form. I couldn't tell exactly what it was. And he put it on the counter and said, I don't know what to do with it. I, I have to mail it. <laughs> he was serious. The, the post office employee very kindly said, I can sell you an envelope. <laughs> and she did. And he said, OK, so what do I do now? I'm not, no, I'm not kidding. This really happened. Um, and she said, you need to write your address across the top um, left here. And he proceeded to do that in one straight line. <laughs> it was later covered up by a stamp. 
and then she said, and you need to write the address of the person you're sending it to here in the middle. And he did that in one straight line until he ran out of room and then he went to the other side of the envelope and started writing. And I thought, this is an amazing example of somebody who has very high technology use and very low literacy in document use because he didn't know how to send a letter. So people don't always have the same skill base, right, as you know, in all of the nine um, uh, essential skills. And I thought, wow. So there are people out there who have high technology, maybe higher technology than you have, who still need your services. They still need the good work you're doing. So don't ignore social media by thinking that um, just because somebody might need help in one area, that um, they don't need, you know, that, that they're not accessing social media. Um, now, the, as you probably heard during the conference, um, Facebook and Twitter, uh, and there are more out there. Um, they're the fastest growing way of communicating, right? And the other thing to remember is that these aren't static. So 10 years ago, maybe eight years ago, um, Facebook of course didn't exist then, or maybe it did, but we didn't use it very much. It was another tool called MySpace. And now MySpace has gone down in usage and Facebook has gone up. So these things aren't static. It's not like the telephone that we've had for a hundred years. Um, and now there's, they're talking about another one coming in, there's a new competitor to Facebook. So when you hear about those new competitors, you want to be on there. The new one coming out is called Diaspora. I don't know if it's out yet. If it's not out, it's coming. So when you hear about these new social media, you or somebody in your organization wants to go in, get the name for your organization so nobody else has it, and try, if you can, try and keep the same name for all of your social media, if, if it's possible. Um, I started out well, there's tons of Sarah Eaton's out there. There's a couple of researchers. There's one who even works in marketing. So I couldn't, I couldn't use my name for all of, all of those, so I tend to use my middle name as well. So, but if you can, try and keep the same name, get onto new social media when it comes out, uh, and use it. Okay. Oh, and while you're at it, by the way, my Facebook and Twitter names are on page two. So let's be Facebook friends. <laughs> it's on page three. I moderate two groups, one on Facebook and one on LinkedIn called Marketing Language Programs. So if you're on Facebook or you're on LinkedIn, feel free to join those groups because that's where educators get together and share resources on how to, how to market language programs better. Okay. So I'm on LinkedIn as well. We can be LinkedIn friends, so go ahead and find me. Okay. In the 21st century, um, a website that you can update yourself is something that you want. So it's very 20th century to pay a web designer to produce a fancy website for you and then you pay them more money to keep updating it for you. Anybody still doing that? No? Okay. Great. Um, well, it keeps the web designers employed it, it <laughs> and it's great for them. Uh, it's not so great for you. So nowadays people want a website that they can update themselves and it can be as simple as a blog. WordPress is becoming a favorite among uh, many organizations, small businesses and community organizations that are doing their own website. Okay. Let's keep going, page six. One of the ways of reaching out to community, of course, is to have an event. Uh, when I work with uh, educational and community-based programs, I, you want two events. You want one in the spring and you want one in the fall. They each take six to eight weeks to put together. It's a heck of a lot of work and it's worth it. Why? Because you're getting people through your doors, they're learning about your programs, um, and eventually this is a way to recruit volunteers, uh, approach your funders, get more learners. I like to think of um, the fall event can be an open house introducing your program to the community with the beginning of a new academic or school year. People still have a mindset that uh, the beginning of the year starts in September when it comes to learning. So if you have an October event, you need August and September to get ready for that, which is really tricky because you've got all your new programs starting. Paper and digital invitations, um, depending again on your, uh, who you're talking to, paper invitations are still very, very important.